quiet, please. Excuse me. Excuse me. Hello, everyone. All right. So, since I'm today's host, and since I'm surrounded by friends who just participated in the Sackler Conference down the street, I have no problem saying that we've saved the best colloquium for last. <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Monzi Cosleywell, who is visiting us from Caltech, where she's Assistant Professor of Astronomy. I know Monzi to be an energetic scientist uh, who isn't afraid to boldly go in wavelength and time regimes where people have never gone before, right? <laughs> and if they haven't, well, she's likely going to be the first to get there and characterize it the best. I say this because of the tremendous success she's had with the Palomar Transient Factory, where she's kind of, she had this mission to bridge the luminosity gap between novae and supernovae. Now, me, I look at the, the diagram, and I'm happy that there's two families, but she saw an opportunity, <laughs> and she took it. Uh, some trivia. So I learned today that after finishing as an undergraduate at Cornell, I hope you don't mind if I share this with everybody, uh, in a degree in applied engineering physics, she went to, or should I say she was actually flown to Wall Street to, to have an interview with Citibank. So given her rapid rise and success in transient astronomy, I wonder uh, what it would be like, because she ultimately declined that offer. I wonder if she actually took that offer, <laughs> what kind of billionaire she would be like today <laughs> afterwards. I don't know if you think about that much, but we're very happy that you've uh, stayed in astronomy. The, uh, we are more enriched because of it. Uh, well, I'll leave it at that. Manzi, we all look forward to your talk today, your explosive talk, nonetheless, on the dynamic infrared sky, please. Thank you very much, Danny. That was a very generous introduction. Um, I hope I live up to that and you enjoy the next hour. Um, so thank you very much to Howard for having me here today um, as their final colloquium speaker. Uh, let's try to end with a bang. Um, so quite literally, uh, today I'm going to tell you about the dynamic infrared sky. Uh, but before I go further, I'd like to dedicate this talk to Professor James Houck. Uh, he was my undergraduate advisor at Cornell University. Um, I was at Cornell when the Spitzer Space Telescope was launched, and, um, and I, I, I think I'm an astronomer today uh, thanks to that experience. Okay, um, so let's get started. Um, so my motivation behind uh, venturing into this new unexplored phase space, um, it's actually the perk of this new job I have at Caltech. Um, I walked into uh, my office on September 1st of uh, 2015, and the first thing I see is an old desk. If you look closely at the desk, you'll see stains of coffee mug stains and slightly smaller than coffee mug stains too, uh, but we'll get to that later. And I was wondering, why do I have this like giant desk in my office? There wasn't even a chair, there was just a desk. Um, so then I realized that there's a pink sticky note and the desk was the desk of Professor Fritz Zwicky. Uh, and within a few days of arriving at Caltech, I got an email from his daughter saying, would you like the matching bookshelf and books and the typewriter? <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I, 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 I'm deeply honored to have an office with uh, you know, such literal inspiration. So Caltech takes standing on the shoulders of giants very, very seriously. Um, so Professor Zwicky um, is an inspiration. Um, this is what I call the Zwicky diagram. Um, Danny described this to you. Um, when I was at Harvard in 2010, that's um, you know, when um, I first described this, this diagram. So this is just uh, taking the optical transient phase space, uh, plotting it by two parameters, peak luminosity in physical units for those who prefer Earths per second, and time scales from one day to 100 days. Two families of explosions we know very, well, very, very deeply about, classical novae, thermonuclear explosions in the surfaces of white dwarfs, two flavors of supernovae, uh, white dwarf explosions here, and deaths of massive stars here. This diagram is from 2005. Very outdated. This diagram now looks like this when I was at Harvard the last time. Actually more like this. There are many, many new classes of explosions. And your very own Maria Drought, who just graduated, uh, 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 I think, a few days ago. Um, Dr. Drought has told you about a new class, which I haven't yet added to this diagram, but which lives right here, of fast blue transients from panthers. Um, but I'm not going to be telling you about any of this, because this game, I've had to take my diagram and squeeze it to the right and push it up, because phase space is opening up even more. 
the revolution in optical time domain surveys is intense. And what we are after now is something that lives in this part of the diagram, the mergers of neutron stars um, with another neutron star or neutron star black holes. Um, so, um, but I'm going to disappoint you yet again because I'm not going to be talking about electromagnetic counterparts to gravitational waves. Uh, Wiki, is going, Wiki Calagera is here, and she's going to be telling you about that tomorrow um, afternoon. Um, so she will tell you about the dawn of the gravitational wave era, uh, where LIGO is going to hear gravitational waves, and the astronomers are going to go find the associated gold and platinum and the sites of heavy element nuclear synthesis. Um, this will happen. Um, I'm optimistic. And um, this uh, revolution in time domain astronomy is being taken to the next frontier uh, with many, many facilities. There is, um, I would say, at least a dozen facilities coming online um, in the next few years to search new, uh, new and um, uh, the optical phase space in much, uh, much more intensely than it has ever been done before. My favorite is this one on Palomar Mountain um, called the Zwicky Transient Facility, uh, where we are building a 47 square degree camera. Uh, the ca the, all 16 CCDs are actually in our lab already. So this one will be put on the telescope May 2017, um, so exactly one year from now. And we have a robotic spectrograph that will be doing the follow-up. And uh, this is the National Science Foundation uh, Mid-Scale Innovation Program. And we will have a survey speed of about uh, nearly 4,000 square degrees an hour. So we run out of sky in four hours. That's how fast we are imaging the sky. Um, but we don't stop there. Um, I'm also organizing a follow-up. Um, since we're going to be looking now in the sub-day regime, an hour, um, hour and daytime scales, sunrise starts to get in the way uh, and becomes quite annoying that the Earth doesn't rotate a little bit slower. Um, so, um, so we try and follow up these very ephemeral flashes of light that are rapidly declining by going around the globe, um, with, by making friends with people in many different countries and or organizing and orchestrating a, a dedicated systematic follow-up campaign. Um, so just as an example, uh, the first one uh, to undergo this sort of follow-up. Um, this again, you'll hear about Wiki tomorrow, this first gravitational wave detection um, from two 30 solar mass black holes. Um, we went and imaged with our Palomar telescopes, got eight candidates, and within two hours, uh, and two hours is the upper limit, in less than two hours, we got eight spectra and classified all eight. So, um, so that's, um, that's great. If, if um, gravitational waves are in fact associated with um, bright blue flashes of light in the optical wave bands, I think we'll find it, okay? Now, the only question is, what if, they, what if um, enough free neutrons don't escape in beta decay? Or what if that hypermassive neutron star is not stable enough for just 100 milliseconds and we get no optical light at all? Um, so the theorists have been uh, scaring us and that you know, this is, may or may not happen. And in fact, most of the emission that you see from these exotic mergers may be in a completely different wave band, which is the infrared. Um, so let me ex explain that a little bit more. Um, so uh, what uh, theorists in particular, Dan Kaysen, Brian Metzger, um, and others have shown um, is that um, when a neutron star merges with another neutron star or a black hole, um, you have a heavy element synthesis. And you have our, your, our process nuclear synthesis. You're, you're synthesizing elements with atomic mass numbers between 100 and 200. So these are your lanthanides and actinides, um, that part of the periodic table. And as you will remember from freshman chemistry, I mean, these are quantum principal quantum numbers Gs of 14. And um, opacities depend on G factorial times G, uh, N factorial divided by G minus N factorial, so, and that whole thing squared. So basically, these things might be very, very opaque when it comes to um, uh, the optical wave bands. And the peak of the emission might be in the infrared. So unless you have free neutrons that can escape all of this, or you have a hypermassive neutron star that's, that remains stable for a few hundred milliseconds, all of that emission might be in the infrared. And in the infrared, astronomy as a community is very ill-equipped. I just told you about a 47 square degree camera in the optical. The biggest, widest infrared field of view camera we have is the Vista camera. And we don't even have that. That's, it's the Europeans. Um, and that's a 0.6 square degree camera. And it's a $40 million, very expensive camera on, um, that, that we have. Next is 0.16 square degrees, which is UCURT. And everything else is 0, 0.0 something or smaller. So we have no, nowhere near the kind of wide field capability 
which is essential to go and image those large localizations, we haven't actually undertaken a systematic infrared search for transients at all. We don't know what the infrared transient sky has to offer. So this really is very new territory, and it's limited by two reasons, two very, very practical, boring reasons. Um, the first is that the night sky is very bright in the infrared, um, and uh, just getting past that sky background, if you're on Earth, is, is a huge problem. You can't get uh, anywhere near the sensitivities you can get in the optical, because the sky is much darker then. Very basic problem. The second problem is that uh, the detector development is dominated or monopolized by one company called Teledyne, and these mercury cadmium telluride detectors are extremely expensive. Um, the per detector cost is, is, is astronomical. Um, so, uh, so the per pixel cost is, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, so, so these two things have actually made astronomers very shy of pursuing something wide field in the infrared. Um, but it doesn't stop some of us. Um, so let me tell you about how I'm beginning to explore uh, the dynamic infrared sky. So um, the first thing I wanted to do um, in order to explore the dynamic infrared sky is um, do what, uh, how, I mean, go back, go, look into history, right? I mean, how were the first supernovae found? They weren't with big wide field cameras. They were by going and looking at individual nearby galaxies one at a time. So I did exactly the same thing, inspired by history and the 1990s in supernovae. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm going to be using the Spitzer Space Telescope and telling you about the survey with the Spitzer Space Telescope, where I picked 200 galaxies within about 30 megaparsec or less. And uh, these are our biggest, brightest galaxies, galaxies with messier names that many of you will recognize. Um, uh, and we just imaged 200 galaxies. It's a very small number, 10 times over three years. This is 1130 hours of Spitzer time, and I'll tell you what we did with it. So um, as Danny mentioned, we are boldly going where no man has gone before, and I should correct, no human has gone before. Um, and uh, this is uh, my group at, uh, at Caltech, my infrared group. Um, there's uh, two young graduate students, Jacob Jenkson and Sama Pontinianot, uh, two first-year postdocs, Ryan Lau and Nadia Blagorodnova. Um, and today, the, 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 the meat of the talk, which is the rest, rest of the talk, will be about eight papers, um, one by each of these people, and uh, one by me, and three by collaborators, um, some of whom might be in the audience, Joel Johansson, uh, Nathan Smith, and Ori Fox. Um, so I'll be telling you about eight papers. Um, so fasten your seatbelts, even if you think this is the enterprise. Um, so we'll now work through what we found by looking at 200 nearby galaxies with Spitzer. OK, so the survey is called SPIRITS. We need fun acronyms. Um, SPIRITS stands for the Spitzer Infrared Intensive Transient Survey. So once again, inspired by Professor Zwicky, I made an infrared version of that optical diagram. And it was surprisingly small. I mean, I, I could plot entire light curves of the handful of novae and handful of supernovae that had been well studied at 3.6 micron. So this is now not just um, luminosity and time scale. This is luminosity as a function of time, because the individual objects whose entire trajectory I'm plotting here. So this is what uh, we, we call light curves here. So you can see that there are two types of novae here, the dust-dominated, metal-dominated, two types of supernovae here. And then these intermediate luminosity red transients, which were in my optical box. These are optically discovered transients, which actually have the bulk of their emission in the, in the infrared wave bands, which tells us that the optical was kind of the wrong place to look. Um, if the bulk of the emission is in the infrared wave band. So, um, so these are the intermediate luminosity red transients. And analogous to 2005 in the optical uh, transients game, there's this gap, several magnitudes between novae and, novae and supernovae, and even, these, even if you include uh, these um, intermediate luminosity red transients in the mix. Um, so in order to bridge this gap, once again, we're looking at nearby galaxies, within 30 megaparsec, 194 galaxies. And we realize that Spitzer, uh, we have only one camera, which is pretty small field of view, just five arc minutes by five arc minutes, IRAC. And we'll only get 3.6 micron and 4.5 micron. That's only two points. So we need a little bit more information before we can start constraining models. So the fantastic team, the Spirits team that I just showed you the names of, um, organized a, a very intensive ground-based effort. So you'll see a huge dedication 
of many uh, hundreds of nights of ground-based um, optical imaging where those same 200 galaxies were being monitored on the ground in the optical and the near-infrared wave bands. So for each of those galaxies, we had, and at a very loose cadence, I mean a very slow cadence as far as optical astronomers go, cadences of one week, one month, six month, and one year time scales to be specific. Um, we were monitoring these galaxies with Spitzer, um, and then with ground-based optical and ground-based infrared telescopes. And then when we found things, we would attempt to get uh, spectroscopy. And then um, when we uh, wrote the proposal, you know, I mean, one thing we did not know was rates. We had no idea what to expect. Um, and uh, I will not tell you what I wrote in the proposal because that was actually a much smaller number than what we ended up finding. <laughs> we ended up finding something like 40 explosive transients a year and 1,200 variables, uh, variables that were strong with amplitudes of more than half magnitude per year in these nearby galaxies. It was a treasure trove um, that we had stumbled into. So, um, I'm going to now organize this talk by telling you about the, the slightly better understood classes and then get into the, the new, um, more mysterious um, transients that we are still scratching our heads over. So I'll begin with this, um, with the supernova work in spirits. Um, so supernovae we have been studying for um, centuries and we understand them, the different classes. Um, this is now um, a collage of light curves detected by um, the spirit survey with uh, 4.5 micron luminosity, mid-infrared luminosity, light curves of different classes of supernovae. So this here is a compilation of type 1A supernovae by Joel Johansson. This is core collapse supernovae by uh, my student, um, Samapon. Uh, type 1A CSM supernovae by Ori Fox. And this one is, is a mystery. We'll come back to that, that, that point here. But what we ended up finding is that, um, not surprisingly, type 1A supernovae were extremely hard to detect in the mid-infrared wave bands. In fact, we were very lucky to get this beautiful light curve. Most of these points actually come from supernova 2014J, which decided to go off um, in the first month of our survey, which was very convenient. Uh, <laughs> and we were able to sample the very early time. We had already scheduled these M82 observations with Spitzer. Um, because Spitzer is very slow to respond if it is not already in the queue, and we were able to get a pretty good light curve of supernova 2014J. Add a few more nearby type 1A supernovae, this is everything in the archive. So we also mined the, the Spitzer Heritage Archive um, for the past um, uh, dozen years or so, uh, and got all the points we could on known optical supernovae. Um, with core collapse supernovae, um, it was very interesting. There was actually quite a bit of diversity in these light curves. Um, we were detecting some co-collab supernovae decades after the, the co-collab supernova went off. There was still some little bit of dusty emission which was, which was slowly fading. There were others that we were seeing several years later where there was um, suddenly a, a, a sudden episode of dust formation or uh, dust destruction. So dust destruction made the light curve just, just go down, dust formation go up. So there was a lot of um, diversity in the co-collab supernovae um, are in Gear's paper which uh, is on archive and um, has been revised for AppGL. Um, and this type 1A CSM supernovae were the ones that interact with the circumstellar medium and that Orifox has been leading an effort for for several years. Um, so let's uh, break this up a little bit more uh, and dig a, dig a little bit deeper into some of these light curves. So this here is the compilation um, of type 1A supernovae. We know these are um, some sort of explosions of um, carbon oxygen white dwarfs. Um, and this is now 4.5 micron, 3.6 micron, the near infrared, and the optical points. And these are all the type 1A supernovae that have mid infrared detections. So they are good standardizable candles in the optical. They're even easier to standardize in these near infrared, mid infrared wave bands. And you don't have to worry about extinction. So they actually, uh, if, if the sample was large enough and the, and the photometry is precise enough, this could be would be an even better way to go about um, cosmology with type 1A supernovae. But physically, in terms of the progenitor systems, what Joel showed in his paper uh, was that um, you could start to constrain things like how much immediately around that type 1A supernova, how much dust was there. So he could exclude, um, based on the fact that you see the smooth decline here, um, the, the absence of dust in these, uh, circumstellar dust in these systems, which would point towards this being, it, it, being less probable this is a single degenerate versus double degenerate 
uh, type of system. So these are the strongest limits on the circumstellar dust um, from the mid-infrared wave bands. Um, and if you're interested, you can see the details um, in this paper. But there was one supernova that stuck out like a sore thumb. This was also a type 1A supernova, supernova 2014DT. Um, it's supposed to be a type 1A supernova. Everything else falls in this blue band. This one wants to be where the co-collapse supernovae are. But we know from optical observations of this event, and there's a nice paper by Ryan Foley, which describes the optical photometry spectroscopy. It looks like a type 1A supernova, but one of these low-velocity ones. Um, so it's kinematically peculiar in that the velocities in, this, in the supernova are more like, I think, 6,000 kilometers per second instead of 10,000 kilometers per second. It happens in this beautiful uh, M61 galaxy, uh, but it has an extremely strong mid-infrared emission or excess um, at late times, um, which is several magnitudes off of what you would expect from all the other type 1A supernovae that we have detected with, with spirits. Um, so what could be going on here? Um, not the, the, the correct answer is actually we don't know. Uh, because um, even after Ori Fox, my collaborator, um, put together this paper, uh, we've continued to monitor M61 with spirits, and this thing's gotten even brighter, if that's possible. So one of the ideas for what this infrared emission was was that um, the carbon-oxygen white dwarf exploded, uh, but it left behind a bound remnant because this was a deflagration, not a detonation, and this bound remnant is red and dusty. Uh, but if it was the bound remnant, it wouldn't be getting even brighter. So, um, so the, the last observation we have is um, just from a few days ago, and, and it's continuing to rise. Um, so I think the, the jury on what is either creating um, a strong episode of dust formation or what exactly could explain infrared excess in this peculiar low-velocity type 1A supernova um, is still out. I mean, so, um, so, uh, so Joel Johansson is working on... Um, a second paper to try and explain what this um, rebrightening in the mid infrared could be all about. Okay, um, so that's the supernovae, you know, the supposedly, I would say, better understood classes, relatively uh, better understood classes. Now I want to focus on those 15 events um, that we have, the, and actually that's only in the first year, we now have 37 of these events um, uh, to date total. Uh, which are exclusively infrared events, or predominantly infrared e events. Um, so these are events that were missed by optical surveys and picked up um, by uh, infrared searches like the one uh, that I'm describing. So uh, let's begin with, um, uh, with Spirits 15C, uh, which uh, graduate student Jacob Jenkson is, is um, putting together. Uh, this um, is actually... Uh, a, a simpler one of the mysteries that I'll be describing, in that it, um, since we've been monitoring these galaxies um, from the ground, um, even though we detect, discovered this in the, in the infrared wave bands, it actually had optical detections as well um, in the time frame between the two Spitzer observations. Um, so in case you haven't used Spitzer before, just a quick refresher, Spitzer is at, at the El Lagrange point. So for most pieces of sky, it has a 40-day window in which it can look. Then for six months, it can't look, and then it can come back to that piece of sky for 40 days. Again, it's open, the visibility window. Um, so this is just an orbital constraint. So for this particular event, what happened was that um, in um, uh, July of 2014, there was no detection. Um, in the six months in, in, intervening, we, ha we actually had detections in the optical and near infrared wave bands, but we didn't know because we are only searching the Spitzer bands. And then in um, February of 2014, um, uh, 15, we actually discovered it with the mid-infrared uh, with Spitzer. Um, so um, so, uh, so that, those are the, just the mechanics of, of the discovery. Uh, the most important clue that we have about this particular transient is that we obtained a spectrum in the near-infrared um, in February, so about 200 days after um, explosion, as we know from the optical data, um, and uh, the spectrum showed one very prominent emission line and a few more um, re relatively weaker emission lines. And this prominent emission line is centered at 10, 8, 30 micron, uh, which some of you might recognize. It's helium-1 um, at 10, 8, 30 micron. And the velocity width of this line was 8,000 kilometers per second. So something has a velocity width of 8,000 kilometers per second. We know it's an explosive event. Um, it uh, couldn't be something eruptive. 
Um, so um, it's almost a supernova, not quite, but pretty high up there. So let's dig into this object, this case study, a little bit more to try and understand what all these clues are telling us about possible progenitor scenarios. So the first thing to do with these nearby galaxies is see if it's in the, the Hubble archive, right? Is there a progenitor star that could be a very important clue um, as to what sort of explosion we are seeing? So this one was an IC2163. Um, I'm sorry, is there a question? Okay. Um, and it's an IC2163 and NGC2207, which is a beautiful nearby interacting pair. It's an HLA image. Um, and if you zoom into this position, this is the spitzer detection, uh, the non-detection um, from uh, in, in the archive, and this is the subtraction image, and this here is the HST image. So even though there's a star just outside that error circle, there's nothing inside that error circle. So down to about minus seven absolute magnitude, we can rule out a progenitor star in these images, uh, which means that for supernovae, for co-collab supernovae, um, if it was a massive star that was unobscured, we, would, we should have seen it. I mean, this is a deep enough limit so that it's interesting for um, a massive star origin, unless you take into account um, obscuration with that caveat. So there's no progenitor in the HST images. We know it's in the, in the spiral arm of this galaxy in a region of intense star formation in an interacting galaxy pair. So that's all background context. The spectrum, the helium-1 line in particular at 10 30 micron, reminded me of um, another supernova, supernova 2011-DH um, in Messier 51, which is um, what is called a type 2B supernova. So let me just uh, clarify the terminology, you know, since not everybody here might be supernovae, uh, think about supernovae every day. So type 2B uh, means um, it's a core collapse supernova, uh, which is hydrogen rich. That's what the type 2 part is. And B is that uh, it has some helium as well. In fact, initially we see the helium, see the hydrogen um, depending on the phase of the spectrum. So this could be a transitional class between uh, 2Bs and 1Bs, which are helium-rich co-collapse supernovae. Um, so that's just um, a side note on the, that terminology. But this supernova 2011-DH was extremely well studied. It was an M51, uh, which is only, um, I think, 8 megaparsec away. Um, so it, it's, um, it's very close. It was intensely studied. And if you look at the spectrum, which was also 200 days later of 2011-DH, I've marked the different lines here. Uh, and compare it to um, 15C, you can see that the helium-1 emission at least looks reminiscent, and some of the other lines, which are much lower signal to noise, um, are about roughly at the right place. So this, the spectrum is not an exact match, but it is very reminiscent of this type 2B phenomenon. So could it be that this is an obscure type 2B supernova that was just missed by optical surveys um, uh, because it was fainter or just extincted? Um, so we started taking that hypothesis um, forward and seeing if that, you know, all the different clues would fit together. So the first problem I already told you was that um, if it was, if 2011-DH, we actually detected the progenitor in that case. It was a yellow supergiant. Um, and that yellow supergiant would have been visible in this image. It's brighter than that, that detection limit. We don't see it. So maybe it was an obscured yellow supergiant, since the supernova also is obscured. So we tried to make sense of the photometry just using extinction. So um, what Jacob's done here is um, try to fit the very well sampled 2011-DH um, uh, known type 2B supernova light curves at all the different wave bands, um, leaving the extinction as a free parameter. So trying to find the best with extinction model um, uh, that could explain this in the obscured supernova context. Um, so what you'll see here is that, um, you know, he can try to fit the optical points. I mean, he can constrain the explosion date pretty well, right? Because we have an upper limit here and a detection here in um, I-band um, based on a ground-based monitoring. Um, so if this line doesn't look so bad, I mean, you can even explain the R-band and maybe even the G. Um, but the infrared points, like look at this dashed gray, dotted gray line with these detections here and here or this one, the infrared bands make no sense. Um, so at least using a simple extinction law, um, and he tried to vary both Rv and, um, and uh, E of V minus V, um, there is no um, internally consistent way to explain this as an obscured supernova. So if it is an obscured supernova, we know it is something explosive, um, then um, we would need to invoke some other physics, I mean, something that would change the extinction law or something that would make this infrared um, 
a little bit brighter at 4.5 micron and a little bit fainter at 3.6 micron. Um, some, something, some ingredient has to be added to this story. Alternately, this could not be an obscured supernova. This could be some other sort of helium-rich explosion. Um, theorists have no dearth of models, which are um, helium-rich explosions. Um, for example, um, you know, in the context of the helium nova, um, V445 Pappus in our own galaxy, um, that was um, a helium white dwarf that's undergoing uh, thermonuclear runaway. Um, so there could be some sort of more helium-rich explosion um, that could explain this, and then you wouldn't necessarily expect the same um, uh, light curve as you do from, from type 2b supernovae. Um, so this is, um, this is uh, you know, we, we have a, a possible guess, but um, it's not a perfectly uh, self-consistent guess. Not all the pieces um, fit together here. Okay. Um, but the story only gets more complicated uh, because, um, or gets more puzzling, I should say, um, if not more complicated. Uh, because as I told you, of these 40 transients um, per year that we found in the first year itself, um, 21 were supernovae, 4 were novae, and then 15 were these mysteries. Um, so what I'm showing you here are just, um, again, the mechanics, where we get an image, we subtract it with respect to an archival image, and we detect uh, these infrared transients. So these are not, I'm not talking about, I'm showing this to you because I'm not talking about something that is uh, signal to noise of three, where you have to squint and look backwards and maybe you see something. These are booming, strong um, uh, detections. In fact, the way we identify our transients is that um, I assign homework to my team. And my team is very senior people, people who have many, many decades, you know, um, who were astronomers before I was born. Let's just put it this way. Um, and uh, everybody gets assigned a galaxy, and we get new data from the Spitzer Space Telescope. Uh, Spitzer has kindly agreed to do an early release of this time critical data for time domain astronomers. Um, so Spitzer does an early release. Our pipelines automatically take that data, process it all the way through, do this image subtraction, come up with these candidate transients, and then each member of my team gets assigned a galaxy. So if your galaxy is M51 today, you go to the web page, you spend your five precious minutes looking through the candidates, and then you save to the database anything that you see uh, that uh, looks booming, bright, interesting, and a transient. So our, um, this is a very simple way to do this. Um, so any, everything that I'm telling you today is only a lower limit on rates. Um, because I'm quite sure there are many more transients in this data set um, than we found, and it's already a very staggeringly large number. So just keep that in, my, in, your, in your mind as, as we go through some of these more mysterious events. Uh, the next um, very visual clue, um, in addition to the, these being very obviously bright uh, detections in the infrared wave bands, is locations, the host galaxies. The host galaxies of these events, um, until last month, were exclusively grand spiral hosts. Um, so, um, so let me just at this point tell you what my um, selection criteria were in selecting these 200 nearby galaxies. Um, so out to about five megaparsec, um, we decided we would be completely agnostic to galaxy type, dwarfiness, um, uh, star formation rates. So out to about five megaparsec, we have more or less a complete sample. The only galaxies we exclude are the ones that are too big, like M31, LMC, SMC. These are just too big um, for the five arc minute by five arc minute field of view. Um, some others, which are just a little bit big, we'll tile and mosaic with Spitzer. Um, so we'll spend a little bit longer on them. But out to about five megaparsec, which is about 64 galaxies or so, um, we have um, a pretty complete sample. Then between five and 15 megaparsec, we pick the most massive galaxies and the most uh, luminous galaxies. And um, beyond 15, it's mostly the Virgo cluster. So members of the Virgo cluster. So this has your red and dead ellipticals, um, very massive red and dead ellipticals, some grand spirals. Um, so um, that's, that's sort of the selection criteria for these uh, 200 galaxies that we're monitoring. So it was surprising to us that um, uh, most of the transients, ex with, an, with the exception of two transients that we just found last month, um, uh, were in grand spiral hosts, in spiral arm locations, in regions of intense star formation. So that's, that's one clue into, into uh, any model that you might come up with um, to explain these events, that they're associated with young populations, um, not necessarily, at least predominantly, if not exclusively. Um, the second criteria is that they're cold. 
Now we had this whole set of telescopes that were monitoring these galaxies so we can get beautiful LCDs with many points to fit. And uh, what we ended up seeing was that the, the, by, even by the time they got to the optical and um, near-infrared wave bands, SEDs were crashing. So they were very, very hard to detect in the optical and the near-infrared wave bands. In fact, um, uh, we, we started to then define a subset of our transients, which are these 15 transients, where we have no optical detections whatsoever. Even if we attempt it with Keck, with HST, the biggest glass we have on the ground, the deepest we can go from space, we were just not picking them up um, in the optical wave bands. And some of these optical images are very high cadence images. So it's not just that the optical flash was shorter lived and we missed it. Um, some of them are pretty deep. So we have a mix of different uh, limits. Uh, so whatever these, um, these transients are, they're predominantly um, or especially red transients. And if you fit your black bodies to these two points that, that you get from splitter, 3.6 and 4.5 micron, the color temperatures are between 500 and um, about 3,000 Kelvin. So they're very cold. Um, events. So um, let's go back to the phase space um, that, that motivated us originally and put these 15 events on that phase space. Um, so here are the novae um, and the supernovae and the intermediate luminosity red transients. Um, so I have to come up with another acronym so that I can start to call them something. Um, so uh, we have started calling these uh, SPRITE, which stands for Especially Red Intermediate Luminosity Transient Events. Um, and you can credit Ryan Lau, my postdoc, for this. I mean, it's, it's, it's about uh, as kooky as acronyms get in astronomy, <laughs> okay? But we have to just call them something. You can call them your favorite uh, acronym, or give me a new su suggestion for a better acronym, I'll take it. Um, but these are, these are where these uh, transients lie in terms of their light curves. So the dotted lines are uh, the same transient evolving. You can see some are rising fast, some are declining slowly. And actually, most of them started to fall off the plot in 1,000 days, because there was a problem with this plot. Um, what I'm showing you here, the first year detections only. I'm not showing you the more recent uh, detections. So in the first year, the upper limits that we had for the transients that we were detecting were from anywhere in the archive. So anywhere in, the, in, the, in a 10-year archive that somebody else decided to look at that galaxy and don't see something. So the upper limits that we had in the first year were not terribly constraining. And so the age of the explosion is whenever that upper limit was and, and when that 2014 detection was. So most of them actually don't have very well constrained explosion time. Some, we have an upper limit from the same year, and so you can constrain the explosion time better. So this was sort of not the right morphological box that uh, you know, I think Professor Zwicky would, would, would think in, right? Because you don't have the upper limits. You don't have this time evolution well constrained. So I thought, let me try a different uh, box to try and understand and zoom into this population. So I removed the, the time axis and instead made an HR diagram, but in the infrared. Okay? So now what I'm plotting here is luminosity. And this is not just peak luminosity. This is luminosity at all phases. Um, and this here is now color at 3.6 minus 4.5 micron. And the time is, is, is all over. Right? I mean, this is all the same supernova and where it's evolving in time. And if you look at this diagram, it's, um, there are more points here, but you can still see the phase space of these sprites is, is different. Even the dustiest novae, the most dust-dominated novae, reach up here. These are these triangles. Supernovae are quite blue, and even the reddest ones, we now have this whole sample in um, Geotinia Nott's paper and Joel Johansson's <laughs> paper and Uri's paper, they, they live here. The intermediate luminosity red transients that I told you about, they're mixed in with the core collapse supernovae there. And these uh, sprites are in the middle here. And uh, they are, they are uh, quite red. I mean, they're all redder than at least zero, and they might go all the way up to 1.7, which is the coldest events um, that we have in the sample. Um, in fact, there's one that's um, even off the charts here, which is the 15, Spirits 15C that I told you about first, which is at three mags. Um, so it's a color temperature of only a few hundred, 200 um, and 50 Kelvin, which is off the charts here. Um, so even in the first year, we were finding um, events which were both red and, and in this intermediate luminosity range. Um, so, uh, so now let's look at a few more case studies and understand what are the possibilities for the origin of this class of, of predominantly, especially red infrared transients, the sprites. OK, um, so let's start off with a rather slow sprite, 
Uh, this is Spirits 14 AJC in M83, Messier 83, which is, a, again, a very rich star-forming galaxy that uh, some of you might have worked with. Um, this uh, was a very slow event. I mean, all we saw for this transient was a whole bunch of upper limits. It turned on. Um, this, we got a detection. And then for the last few years, it's just been flat. So it hasn't done much in, in its light curve, either, um, either in terms of its luminosity or its color. Luminosity and color are pretty steady. So it just looks like a, it, it turned on and it's evolving. It's faded by less than half a magnitude in, in four years. So it's a very, very slowly evolving transient in M83. If you look at the location, um, I'm not sure if it's dark enough, but here you can see this red cross is the location. This here is a CO map of M83 from the Nobuyama um, millimeter array. Uh, apologies, I forgot the reference there. Um, but in this CO map of M83, it's in a, in a, in a region of pretty um, high star formation there. Um, but the most interesting clue, again, comes from the spectrum that we got with uh, MOSFIRE on Keck. Um, where uh, we see a molecular hydrogen line. Um, so this emission line, and we don't see just one H2 transition. We see five very narrow emission lines. And I show you the 2D version because um, these lines were very puzzling when I first saw them. I saw these five lines in the spectrum, and I'm, I'm usually an optical transient astronomer. I think of hydrogen a lot, but I think of ionized hydrogen. I don't think about molecular hydrogen. So it was... Um, Pretty surprising to take a spectrum and see molecular hydrogen in the spectrum, okay, H sub 2. Um, so, um, so there's molecular hydrogen in the spectrum. And there are five, five lines like this. And um, if you look at the velocity of this molecular hydrogen, that velocity is consistent with the underlying CO um, map velocity. So whatever CO cloud, the molecular cloud that was in, um, the velocity in that is consistent with the velocity of this line. If you look at the relative line ratios of these five lines, um, then those relative line ratios are consistent with a shock, um, a 1,000 Kelvin shock in, in, the, in this particular molecular cloud. So let's try and put these pieces together and come up with an idea of what could be driving a shock in this, mo in this uh, uh, molecular cloud. Um, so the cartoon picture I have here um, is from John Valley, um, who's my collaborator at the University of Colorado. And uh, what, what this molecular hydrogen reminded him of was OMC1, uh, which is um, the Orion molecular cloud uh, and the Beckland Neugebauer object in it. Um, so if, if you look in our own galaxy in a region which is forming young stars um, and uh, lots of them, when um, there's non hierarchical um, formation and you, you form massive star binaries, um, you could drive a shock out into that giant mole molecular cloud. And that shock driven by the formation, the birth of the massive star binary in this molecular cloud could excite a 1,000 Kelvin shock with the line velocities we see. So you see the cloud collapsing, forming these, these stars, capturing, forming binaries, and then driving out these jets. So that's, that's one possible explanation. Um, all the clues that we have are consistent with, with this model, but there isn't one that would, um, you know, be, I, I think, be slam dunk. I mean, there is a molecular hydrogen. That's consistent. Um, the ratios of the lines are consistent. The velocities of the lines are consistent. The light curve is consistent. At some point, we'll see that shock fade away. Um, so we should continue monitoring M83 um, for, a few, for a few more years just to see that, that shock finally fade away. But that, that seems to be a completely consistent hypothesis. Um, could there be any other ideas of things that could um, drive shocks in molecular clouds? Um, one possibility is that um, it, it's a line of sight effect where um, you have a normal supernova explosion. Um, and a, a molecular cloud just happened to be in the same line of sight as you and that, and that supernova. And you're, you're just seeing a slowed down version of that light come out as it goes through that, that molecular cloud. Um, but there are many problems with, with that, right? I mean, one is line of sight coincidence might not be that easy, even in M83, which, is, which has large numbers of GMCs, very star forming. Getting that line of sight to work and the geometry to all work is not, um, um, is not all that, um, that probable. And even if that was the case, the fact that we see nothing explosive in our spectrum, right? I mean, none of the supernova light retained a broad H alpha 8,000, 10,000 kilometers per second um, line emission or any of the other supernova features, there's barely any continuum in the spectrum. Um, if we had a mid-infrared spectrograph, um, if IRS was still, uh, the infrared spectrograph that Jim Hauck built on Spitzer was still working, 
Um, and since it was still cold, maybe we could have gotten an infrared spectrum and tested this hypothesis. Um, uh, or if Josh launches the, the TSO and gets mid infrared spectrum, that, that might solve it. But, but right now, these are all the clues that we have. So I would say the best model, or the relatively consistent with all the clues in hand, is this formation of a massive star binary that is in turn driving a shock into the cloud, uh, the giant molecular cloud um, in, in it. And that's where we are seeing uh, the spectrum and the photometry that we are. K-band? No. Yeah, this is a K-band spectrum. That's 2.12 microns? Uh, I don't remember all the five line centers, but there are five lines in K-band, which, which we see. And that's it's around two to two and a half micron. I don't remember the line centers. Um, OK, but sprites have, I mean, th this is not all of our 15 sprites for sure, because sprites have a light curve diversity. Um, this one was a very slowly evolving flat one. Uh, we see some that just rise on a couple of month time scales and then disappear on us completely. We see some that fade away on hundreds of days. We see some that are pretty flat, maybe have some smaller time scale variability. Some that are very um, red initially and then get bluer. Some that do the opposite. Um, so there's a zoo of, of light curves from these 15 transients. So it's hard to imagine that there's one idea that can explain um, these sprites. I mean, there seems so. I think we need to be a little bit more creative and open minded in terms of the different models that could potentially explain it. But we don't have a lot of data to work with, right? We don't have, um, uh, in most of the cases that we attempted to get the deep K band spectroscopy, the transient was so cold that even with um, a few hours of integration with KEC, we were not getting uh, much signal. So we only have this mid infrared photometry um, that we have and our imagination to try and um, make sense of what we found. So I'm going to suggest a few more models um, that have come up, uh, which could be explained in this context. Um, so um, one very nice idea that was presented by Elizabeth Lovegrove and Stan Woosley just at this meeting um, this past week, the Sackler Conference, um, is uh, the formation of stellar mass black holes. Um, so the idea here is that uh, you're forming um, a stellar mass black hole. And you have very low velocities, lots of um, the dust is condensing onto low velocities. So what you ex predict to see theoretically is a slow red transient, a transient that evolves on hundreds of day time scales um, and is predominantly, again, in the infrared wave bands. Um, those two very qualitative properties are, might be consistent with this. Um, but we have no, no way right now to just to say whether any one of our transients is, in fact, um, this, uh, this particular model or not. What we could do is, um, is if we had pre-exclusion HST images for all of them and, and we detected red supergiant progenitors um, or even red giant progenitor, if you could go deep enough um, for these events, you see a massive star and then you see it disappear, then this would be an interesting viable model. But so far, every time we've um, been lucky enough to have HST archival imaging at that location which was deep enough, we've not seen anything. So, um, so at least the most massive end of, or the, or the brightest end of massive stars um, is currently not, um, not a promising um, counterpart. But if it's a red giant, our limits are not deep enough. So it's a possibility, but there's no way to prove or, or disprove um, this hypothesis. Um, another idea uh, that's uh, been proposed theoretically is that um, is stellar mergers. Um, uh, so, um, so I'm going to spend a few, few, few minutes on stellar mergers now. Um, so stellar mergers, um, I'm referring to stars anywhere between um, one solar mass and 50 solar mass um, stars that could come together and merge. Um, the most um, vivid example that we now have of stellar mergers is from the Ogle survey um, in this paper by Talenda et al. 2011, where we actually saw a star with a period of... Um, almost 1.44 days in 2002. Um, the Ogle survey actually measured the period as a function of time for about uh, um, five years here. And they saw this period um, exponentially decline. Uh, when this period exponentially declined to zero here, right, if you extrapolate, the Ogle survey saw a uh, um, uh, um, an outburst that went all the way up to 10 magnitude. 
So they actually saw um, a common envelope evolution that this binary was coming closer and closer together and then merged, and you, and you see a very high amplitude outburst here. So this, by far, is the best example, most convincing example of a stellar merger. There have been a few other candidates since, um, uh, but this one is still the, the Rosetta Stone of what a stellar merger would be. In terms of the binary parameters for this, this was a one-ish solar mass um, K-type uh, star, uh, two one-ish solar mass K-type stars that were merging here. Um, since then, I mean, there have been many theoretical works that have tried to explore or expand this phase space of stellar mergers to all other types of stars um, that are in binary systems and when they come together and merge. Um, so this here again is a luminosity time scale plot uh, with the different classes um, of transients. And in this paper by Andre Petscher, uh, who's a postdoc at Princeton, he, he plots the trajectories of the, the phase space that stellar mergers could live in for different assumptions about the um, orbital parameters. Um, so there are some other candidates here in our own galaxy. Um, and now we think we found a couple um, that seem to be very plausibly um, convincing as very massive stars merging, like, like about something like 20 to 30 solar mass stars merging at the very top end of this, um, of this part of phase space. So, um, so let's look at these two um, in some more detail here. Um, so let's look at uh, a, a transient in M101 first. Uh, this is work by postdoc uh, Nadia. Um, so um, we don't have, um, when we're looking at galaxies, extragalactic distances, we don't have um, the luxury of measuring periods over 10-year time scales and, and actually seeing that period decrease. Um, but we can do a few other things to try and test this progenitor, uh, this particular model. Um, so in the case of this particular transient, uh, there was pre-explosion HST images and uh, images, so progenitor star could be very um, nicely detected and characterized. Um, and then what Nadia has been up to, and she just sent, uh, sent me this part a few, couple of days ago, um, is that um, she tried to fit um, different binary models to this progenitor system. And what she finds is that uh, the measured progenitor radius from our data is this um, gray line here. Um, and the la other line to keep in mind here is, this, is the Roche lobe radius. So just when the star is, is starting to fill its Roche lobe, that's when, um, that's when we see it. So, um, so that's uh, tantalizing, right? I mean, it could have happened anywhere in the age. Um, this is radius as a function of age. It could have, uh, the, the, we could have seen this at, at any age, but we see it right at this phase, uh, which is very, very interesting as a clue to whether this could be a stellar merger. Um, but the usual clues that people look for when looking for stellar merger candidates is that the light curve is multi-peaked. So, um, for example, here's V3 at Mon, one of the galactic massive star mergers. You can see it had three peaks. Um, this is one of the HST poster childs um, from several years ago. And these two extragalactic events, one in M101 and one in NGC 4490, are shown in red and blue here, which also have some hint of, of at least two peaks here, but at much higher luminosity, several magnitudes more in terms of its peak luminosity. Okay, so that's another clue that is consistent with the stellar merger hypothesis, um, but not, might not be exclusive, but at least consistent. Um, the third one is, um, there was a paper by Chris Kochanik which predicted that um, rates for stellar mergers. And in the same paper, he also um, looks at a correlation between peak luminosity and progenitor, progenitor mass. Um, so these galactic mergers are here between um, one and 10 solar masses. Um, a V1309 score was the most vivid example that I showed you earlier. Um, and uh, these two events, um, if Nadia just, Nadia just overplotted their position on uh, Chris Kochanik's relation here, and it seems to extend all the way out to, this is a log plot, all the way out to 30-ish um, you know, solar masses. Um, so this seems, um, uh, again, uh, very consistent with uh, the clues that we have in hand that what we are seeing here are extragalactic stellar mergers. These are also very red events. So if you look at the optical light curves, they fade away on, on uh, hundreds of uh, day time scales. But if you look at the infrared light curves, they remain bright for a very long time. Because merger remnant is also um, a bound, dusty infrared remnant. So the infrared is a good way to um, try and fill in this, um, this diagram and see if this correlation um, is also leads to causation, and, and, the more, and this becomes a, a more unambiguous way of, uh, of uh, pinpointing stellar mergers. Okay. 
Okay, um, I only have a few minutes left. Um, so, a um, couple more possibilities for different things that could explode in the infrared. Um, one is um, electron capture supernovae. So, uh, these are uh, now low mass stars, stars between 8 and 10 solar masses, um, which undergo electron capture in the oxygen and magnesium cores, and they explode as very, very red transients. Um, so there's a large number of papers here, mostly led by um, Ohio State, where they detect a very dusty progenitor, um, which is in the transition between where you form carbon oxygen by dwarfs and where you form neutron stars and undergo normal core collapse. And this 8 to 10, and you can argue it's actually 6 to 10, or um, whatever you, your metallicity assumptions are. There's a, there's a narrow range of the IMF where um, you undergo co core collapse due to electron capture, and you see red dusty transients. Um, but these, I mean, the rates are rather small. These are, you know, the rates of these events are something like 10 to 15 percent of the core collapse supernova rate. And in the Spirit's Galaxy sample, we are only seeing a total of six, so about uh, of, of which four were core collapse supernovae. So we're not quite at the stage where um, we are picking up more of these electron capture supernovae in the Spirit's data because of the size of the the sample. Um, but the last example that I want to leave you with is um, what was called a supernova imposter. Um, this is um, uh, an event that was discovered um, in the optical wave bands um, by an amateur astronomer, Berto Monad, in South Africa. With his, I mean, he has a real job in the day. In the night, he has a, a telescope in his backyard that he uses to get uh, images of pretty galaxies um, and finds transients <coughs> in them. Um, so um, Berto Monad found um, this 2010 DA event, which was labeled an imposter because it was one of these gap transients in that um, it was in this luminosity gap between novae and supernovae. Um, so this was, I mean, there are many different models that were thrown around for what 2010 DA could be, uh, whether it could be an electron capture event, a stellar merger event, a luminous blue variable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the, the main difference between this particular event um, and the other events was that um, this one was accompanied by an X-ray flash. So um, in addition to the, um, the optical emission and the infrared emission, there was an X-ray emission that was discovered by Binder et al. Uh, and published in two papers by that group, Binder et al. 2011 and 2016. So let's put the infrared, the optical, and for the first time in this talk, the X-ray signature together of this particular event. Um, so you can um, you see here now uh, several years um, time scale. I mean, zero is is the 2010 discovery, and you can see that there are multiple peaks of this event. Uh, this is the original discovery data by Berto Monad, as well as uh, some follow up by the SMARTS telescopes by Howard Bond. Um, so you can see that there are at least three eruptions here, and even in the X-rays in the Binder et al. paper, there are multiple eruptions. The infrared is, is now rebrightening and into another very bright eruption. So what is happening here? Why do we have um, a system that is undergoing some sort of eruption again and again and again on these few year time scales? Um, so uh, what the, uh, the binder at all paper based on the X-ray luminosities suggested that this is only possible in an X-ray binary. And if you look at the luminosities here, this, this must be um, this must be an X-ray, a, a low mass X-ray binary with a neutron star in it. And the companion, companion is debatable. Um, they put forward two hypotheses. That their, their preferred one is that this is um, an X-ray binary with a luminous blue variable as a companion. So that makes it easier to explain um, the optical variability. Um, and uh, this is also consistent in that it's in a very young surrounding region. If you look at the stars in the neighboring region to try and infer the age of the system, the binder to our paper says there are two populations. One is at about five mega years, and the other is at about 25 mega years. So maybe it belongs to the five mega year population, and it's a luminous blue variable companion um, to this neutron star. Um, uh, so that's one possibility. The other possibility is that most LMXBs are um, a big majority. Um, sorry, HMXBs. Hi, master. Um, excuse me. Um, so um, could, ha could have a supergiant uh, BE star companion. And if you look at the, the Spitzer data, uh, the green points here show where the um, where this eruption was in outburst and where this eruption was in quiescence. 
And if you compare to, um, uh, in the literature, to where LBVs live in this diagram, which is it's an HR diagram, luminosity at 3.6 micron in color, and where supergiant um, BE stars live, um, it seems like at least at quiet sense, it's more consistent with the supergiant BE star. So it seems like what we found is actually not an LBV with a neutron star, but, um, but an SGBE companion to the neutron star. So with that, um, I'd like to conclude that uh, the dynamic infrared sky, I hope I've convinced you, is, is ripe for exploration. And um, that I have some ideas on where to go from here, which you'll have to just call, invite me again to find out. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention. Questions? Yes. You've been on an enormous amount of near-infrared data uh, from spacecraft which are presumably calibrated. When you measure the brightness of a star, you have to subtract out the backgrounds. <laughs> have you explored whether these backgrounds are either time variable or around the sky variable? Um, it's possible. Um, we haven't actually looked at extended surface photometry on the subtracted images. We've only looked at point sources in our subtracted images. Um, so we modeled the point spread function using um, a, a set of delta functions. It's a PTFIDE algorithm developed by Frank Massey. And we just subtract out the entire galaxy. And what we, what we see, I mean, obviously in our subtraction images are, are bright point sources. We haven't actually explored whether the background itself could be readable at, at the low surface brightness level. Yeah. Have you considered looking at the WISE catalog, which goes much further? It, it starts at the same wavelength as Spitzer, but goes out farther into the infrared. Yes, I have. Um, in fact, Spitzer doesn't give anybody a level in the hours easily. So I had to do my homework. And as part of my homework, I tried to first find these transients in the WISE catalog. Um, and it was very painful. Uh, because I um, mean, Weiss was cold for the first for, for in the beginning, and then it got warm. So you've only left with um, 3.6 and 4.5 micron, roughly. Uh, I think it's slightly different. I think it's 3.4, 3.4, 4.6. Um, but as I say, because I mean, Weiss was shallower, uh, so I looked at the nearby galaxy data in there, and there was a large number of false positives um, because um, at that point um, the post cryo data was not well matched with the pre cryo data. Um, and uh, we went through several candidates, but they all turned out to be some sort of false positives um, when that data was actually stacked for subtraction. Um, so we did try this with WISE, but the coarser resolution um, and the post cryo versus pre cryo differences, um, we, didn't get, we didn't get very far in terms of. We, we found a large number of variables, but not, but not no explosive transients in that work. Um, so that's why we decided to propose to Spitzer to go deeper with slightly better resolution. Can you tell us why there are at least two peaks in the luminosity versus time curve and stellar mergers? Um, there could be even more. Um, I, I think that, um, uh, I, I think that uh, theoretically, I mean, the first peak is, is when the merger just begins, right? And the subsequent peaks are, are more uh, a line of sight effect in terms of the orientation of the system to us. So I, I think the three is, I mean, just what was seen for VA3 at Mon. And if you had even better sampling and even finer resolution, I think you could see <coughs> even more peaks um, as, as the merger happens and, and eventually then fades away. No? I hear you. <laughs> OK. <laughs> But you could tell me. We learned this week that there are some nuclear transients from NEOYs associated with uh, older PDE events. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any nuclear transients from um, the uh, infrared survey that you're doing? Right, there's a nice paper by Short when I was in um, just on Monday, I think, this week. Um, in, in my 200 nearby galaxies, I mean, these are all nearby bright galaxies. I might have some background galaxies, but we're not paying much attention to them. Um, so they would just appear as some sort of variables. Um, so it's possible, but um, uh, I don't know if we have the, the statistics to actually place any meaningful constraints on that. I think for that, you would need a white field infrared survey, um, which is unbiased. So, so no, no candidates on that.
from this end. All right. Any more questions? One more, yes. Okay. So I may actually have misunderstood what you were saying, but there was one, I think, supernova event where you tried to fit with a lot of extinction. Mm -hmm. It didn't quite do all that well on the infrared. Mm -hmm. With dust, there are at least two things that can go on. There's simple extinction, but you could also heat the dust and boost right. the infrared. Did you include that possibility? Um, uh, no, not, not in, that, in that model that I, uh, that I showed you. That was just healing by extinction. So you could add dust to try to explain that infrared excess. So I, I do think that some of these sprites have to be obscured to the uh, But how many of them are in that category, um, I don't know the answer to that. Like how many of them would work with with some sort of um, boosting um, in their um, infrared impact. Some of them have very sparse mid infrared light curves, right? So you could, in principle, put them by extinction, but you have no way to check it unless you have the full infrared. So, um, so some of these should be obscured supernovae, but how many and what that distribution in extinction looks like, I do not know the answer. I don't want to keep people, but following with that question, I want to ask one of my own, because I'm the host and I get to ask these things. Um, to characterize these, it seems uh, like you need a lot more information than just the light curves. And so you showed a spectrum, you showed some x-ray. What about the follow-up? What about radio observations, for instance? Absolutely. And yeah, my graduate student, Jake this is learning about <laughs> the VLA right now. So, we, so radio is actually the one big piece of information that can solve this obscure supernova question. Because um, if there's an obscure supernova there, um, we should be able to detect it to the radio for even longer. Um, than than the that especially at lower frequencies even at hundreds of days it should we should be able to pick up some radio emission so we're putting together a proposal this is all nearby right. stuff so in theory you should yes be those to those levels should be very constrained so that is one one piece of clue we don't have which could help unravel some of these mysteries well let's thank Mazi. classes relatively uh, better understood classes now I want to focus on those 15 events um, that we have uh, and actually that's only in the first year we now have 37 of these events um, uh, to date total uh, which are exclusively infrared events or predominantly infrared e events um, so these are events that were missed by optical surveys and picked up um, by uh, infrared searches like the one uh, that I'm describing so uh, let's begin with um, uh, with Spirits 15C, uh, which uh, graduate student Jacob Jenkson is is um, putting together. Uh, this um, is actually uh, a simpler one of the mysteries that I'll be describing. In that, it, um, since we've been monitoring these galaxies um, from the ground, um, even though we detect discovered this in the in the infrared wave bands, it actually had optical detections as well um, in the time frame between the two Spitzer observations. Um, so in case you haven't used Spitzer before, just a quick refresher, Spitzer is at, at the L to Lagrange point. So for most pieces of sky, it has a 40-day window in which it can look. Then for six months, it can't look. And then it can come back to that piece of sky for 40 days. Again, it's open, the visibility window. Um, so this is just an orbital constraint. So for this particular event, what happened was that um, in um, uh, July of 2014, there was no detection. Um, in the six months in, in, intervening, we, ha we actually had detections in the optical and near infrared wave bands, but we didn't know because we were only searching the Spitzer bands. And then in um, February of 2015, we actually discovered it with the mid infrared uh, with Spitzer. Um, so, um, so, uh, so that, those are the, just the mechanics of, of the discovery. Uh, the most important clue that we have about this particular transient is that we obtained a spectrum in the near infrared um, in February, so about 200 days after um, explosion, as we know from the optical data. Um, and uh, the spectrum showed one very prominent emission line and a few more um, re relatively weaker emission lines. And this prominent emission line is centered at 10830 micron, 
uh, which some of you might recognize. It's helium-1 um, at 10, 8, 30 micron. And the velocity width of this line was 8,000 kilometers per second. So something has a velocity width of 8,000 kilometers per second. We know it's an explosive event. Um, it uh, couldn't be something eruptive. Um, so um, it's almost a supernova, not quite, but pretty high up there. So let's dig into this object, this case study, a little bit more to try and understand what all these clues are telling us about possible progenitor scenarios. So the first thing to do with these nearby galaxies is see if it's in the, the Hubble archive, right? Is there a progenitor star that could be a very important clue um, as to what sort of explosion we are seeing? So this one was an IC2163. Um, I'm sorry, is there a question? OK. Um, and it's an IC2163 and NGC2207, which is a beautiful nearby interacting pair. It's an HLA image. Um, and if you zoom into this position, this is the spitzer detection, uh, the non-detection um, from uh, in, in the archive. And this is the subtraction image. And this here is the HST image. So even though there's a star just outside that error circle, there's nothing inside that error circle. So down to about minus 7 absolute magnitude, we can rule out a progenitor star in these images, uh, which means that for supernovae, for co-collapse supernovae, um, if it was a massive star that was unobscured, we, would, we should have seen it. I mean, this is a deep enough limit so that it's interesting for um, a massive star origin, unless you take into account um, obscuration with that caveat. So there's no progenitor in the HST images. We know it's in the, in the spiral arm of this galaxy in a region of intense star formation in an interacting galaxy pair. So that's all background context. The spectrum, the helium-1 line in particular at 1030 micron, reminded me of um, another supernova, supernova 2011-DH um, in Messier 51, which is um, what is called a type 2B supernova. So let me just uh, clarify the terminology, you know, since not everybody here might be supernovae. Uh, think about supernovae every day. So type 2B uh, means um, it's a core collapse supernova, uh, which is hydrogen rich. That's what the type 2 part is. And B is that uh, it has some helium as well. In fact, initially we see the helium, see the hydrogen, um, depending on the phase of the spectrum. So this could be a transitional class between uh, 2Bs and 1Bs, which are helium rich core collapse supernovae. Um, so that's just um, a side note on the, that terminology. But this supernova 2011-DH was extremely well studied. It was an M51, uh, which is only, um, I think, 8 megaparsec away. Um, so it, it's, um, it's very close. It was intensely studied. And if you look at the spectrum, which was also 200 days later of 2011-DH, I've marked the different lines here, uh, and compare it to um, 15C, you can see that the helium-1 emission at least looks reminiscent. And some of the other lines, which are much lower signal to noise, um, are about roughly at the right place. So this, the spectrum is not an exact match, but it is very reminiscent of this type 2b phenomena. So could it be that this is an obscure type 2b supernova that was just missed by optical surveys um, uh, because it was fainter or just extincted? Um, so we started taking that hypothesis, velocity, light curves of different classes of supernovae. So this here is a compilation of type 1a supernovae by Joel Johansson. This is core collapse supernovae by uh, my student, um, Samapon. Uh, type 1A e CSM supernovae by Ori Fox. And this one is, is a mystery. Uh, we'll come back to that, that, that point here. But what we ended up finding is that, um, not surprisingly, type 1A e supernovae were extremely hard to detect in the mid-infrared wave bands. In fact, we were very lucky to get this beautiful light curve. Most of these points actually come from supernova 2014J, which decided to go off um, in the first month of our survey which was very convenient. Uh, <laughs> and we were able to sample the very early time. We had already scheduled these M82 observations with Spitzer, um, because Spitzer is very slow to respond if it is not already in the queue. And we were able to get a pretty good light curve of supernova 2014J. Add a few more nearby type 1A supernovae. This is everything in the archive. So we also mined the, the Spitzer Heritage Archive um, for the past um, uh, dozen years or so, uh, and got all the points we could on known optical supernovae. Um, with core collapse supernovae, um, it was very interesting. There was actually quite a bit of diversity in these light curves. Um, we were detecting some core collapse supernovae decades after the, the core collapse supernova went off. There was still some little bit of dusty emission, which was, which was slowly fading. There were others that we were seeing several years later where there was um, suddenly a, a sudden episode of dust formation or uh, dust destruction. So dust destruction made the light curve just 
just go down, dust formation, go up. So there was a lot of um, diversity in the core collab supernovae, um, Aaron Gear's paper, which uh, is on archive and um, has been revised for AppJL. Um, and this type 1e CSM supernovae were the ones that interact with the circumstellar medium and that Orifox has been leading an effort for, for several years. Um, so let's uh, break this up a little bit more and dig a, dig a little bit deeper into some of these light curves. So this here is the compilation um, of type 1e supernovae. We know these are um, some sort of explosions of um, carbon-oxygen white dwarfs. Um, and this is now 4.5 micron, 3.6 micron, the near infrared, and the optical points. And these are all the type 1e supernovae that have mid-infrared detections. So they're good standardizable candles in the optical. They're even easier to standardize in these near-infrared, mid-infrared wave bands. And you don't have to worry about extinction. So they actually, uh, if, if the sample was large enough and the, and the photometry is precise enough, this would be, would be an even better way to go about um, cosmology with type 1e supernovae. But physically, in terms of the progenitor systems, what Joel showed in his paper uh, was that um, you could start to constrain things like how much immediately around that type 1e supernova, how much dust was there. So he could exclude, um, based on the fact that you see the smooth decline here, um, the, the absence of dust in these, uh, circumstellar dust in these systems, which would point towards this being, it, it, being less probable this is a single degenerate versus double degenerate uh, type of system. So these are the strongest limits on the circumstellar dust um, from the mid-infrared wave bands. Um, and if you're interested, you can see the details um, in this paper. But there was one supernova that stuck out like a sore thumb. This was also a type 1a supernova, supernova 2014-DT. Um, it's supposed to be a type 1a supernova. Everything else falls in this blue band. This one wants to be where the cocoa lab supernovae are. But we know from optical observations of this event, and there's a nice paper by Ryan Foley, which describes the optical photometry spectroscopy, it looks like a type 1e supernova, but one of these low velocity ones. Um, so it's kinematically peculiar in that the velocities in this in the supernova are more like, I think, 6,000 kilometers per second instead of 10,000 kilometers per second. It happens in this beautiful uh, M61 galaxy, uh, but it has an extremely strong mid-infrared emission or excess um, at late times um, which is several magnitudes off of what you would expect from all the other type 1e supernovae that we have detected with, with spirits. Um, so what could be going on here? Um, now the, the, the correct answer is actually we don't know, uh, because um, even after Ori Fox, my collaborator, um, put together this paper, uh, we've continued to monitor M61 with spirits, and this thing's gotten even brighter, if that's possible. So one of the ideas for what this infrared emission was, was that um, the carbon-oxygen white dwarf exploded, uh, but it left behind a bound remnant because this was a deflagration, not a detonation. And this bound remnant is red and dusty. Uh, but if it was the bound remnant, it wouldn't be getting even brighter. So, um, so the, the last observation we have is um, just from a few days ago, and, and it's continuing to rise. Um, so I think the, the jury on what is either creating um, a strong episode of dust formation, or what exactly could explain infrared excess in this peculiar low velocity type 1a supernova um, is still out. I mean, so, um, so, uh, so Joel Johansson is working on um, a second paper to try and explain what this um, rebrightening in the mid infrared could be all about. Okay, um, so that's the supernovae, and you know, supposedly. I would say better understand uh, the per pixel cost is, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, so, so these two things have actually made astronomers very shy of pursuing something wide field in the infrared. Um, but it doesn't stop some of us. Um, so let me tell you about how I'm beginning to explore uh, the dynamic infrared sky. So um, the first thing I wanted to do um, in order to explore the dynamic infrared sky is um, do what, uh, how, I mean, go back, go look into history, right? I mean, how were the first supernovae found? They weren't with big wide field cameras. They were by going and looking at individual nearby galaxies one at a time. So I did exactly the same thing, inspired by history, uh, in the 1990s in supernovae. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm going to be using the Spitzer Space Telescope and telling you about the survey with the Spitzer Space Telescope, where I picked 200 galaxies within about 30 megaparsec or less. 
And uh, these are our biggest, brightest galaxies, galaxies with messier names that many of you will recognize. Um, uh, and we just imaged 200 galaxies. It's a very small number, 10 times over three years. This is 1130 hours of Spitzer time. And I'll tell you what we did with it. So um, as Danny mentioned, we are boldly going where no man has gone before. And I should correct, no human has gone before. Um, and uh, this is uh, my group at, uh, at Caltech, my infrared group. Um, there's uh, two young graduate students, Jacob Jenkson and Sama Pontinianot, uh, two first year postdocs, Ryan Lau and Nadia Blagorodnova. Um, and today, the, 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 the meat of the talk, which is the rest, rest of the talk, will be about eight papers, um, one by each of these people, and uh, one by me, and three by collaborators, um, some of whom might be in the audience. Joel Johansson, uh, Nathan Smith, and Ori Fox. Um, so I'll be telling you about eight papers. Um, so fasten your seat belts, even if you think this is the enterprise. Um, so we'll now work through what we found by looking at 200 nearby galaxies with Spitzer. OK, so the survey is called SPIRITS. We need fun acronyms. Um, SPIRITS stands for the Spitzer Infrared Intensive Transient Survey. So once again, inspired by Professor Zwicky, I made an infrared version of that optical diagram. And it was surprisingly small. I mean, I, I could plot entire light curves of the handful of novae and handful of supernovae that had been well studied at 3.6 micron. So this is now not just um, luminosity and time scale. This is luminosity as a function of time, because the individual objects whose entire trajectory I'm plotting here. So this is what uh, we, we call light curves here. So you can see that there are two types of novae here, the dust-dominated, metal-dominated, two types of supernovae here, and then these intermediate luminosity red transients, which were in my optical box. These are optically discovered transients, which actually have the bulk of their emission in the, in the infrared wave bands, which tells us that the optical was kind of the wrong place to look um, if the bulk of the emission is in the infrared wave band. So, um, so these are the intermediate luminosity red transients. And analogous to 2005 in the optical uh, transients game, there's this gap, several magnitudes between novae and, novae and supernovae, and even, these, even if you include uh, these um, intermediate luminosity red transients in the mix. Um, so in order to bridge this gap, once again, we're looking at nearby galaxies within 30 megaparsec, 194 galaxies. And we realized that Spitzer, uh, we have only one camera, which is pretty small field of view, just five arc minutes by five arc minutes, IRAC. And we'll only get 3.6 micron and 4.5 micron. That's only two points. So we need a little bit more information before we can start constraining models. So the fantastic team, the spirits team that I just showed you the names of, um, organized a, a very intensive ground-based effort. So you'll see a huge dedication of many uh, hundreds of nights of ground-based um, optical imaging, where those same 200 galaxies were being monitored on the ground in the optical and the near-infrared wave bands. So for each of those galaxies, we had, an, and at a very loose cadence, I mean a very slow cadence as far as optical astronomers go, cadences of one week, one month, six month, and one year time scales, to be specific. Um, we were monitoring these galaxies with Spitzer, um, and then with ground-based optical and ground-based infrared telescopes. And then when we found things, we would attempt to get uh, spectroscopy. And then um, when we uh, wrote the proposal, you know, I mean, one thing we did not know was rates. We had no idea what to expect. Um, and uh, I will not tell you what I wrote in the proposal, because that was actually a much smaller number than what we ended up finding. <laughs> we ended up finding something like 40 explosive transients a year and 1,200 variables, uh, variables that were strong with amplitudes of more than half magnitude per year in these nearby galaxies. It was a treasure trove um, that we had stumbled into. So um, I'm going to now organize this talk by telling you about the, the slightly better understood classes and then get into the, the new, um, more mysterious um, transients that we are still scratching our heads over. So I'll begin with, this, um, with the supernova work in spirits. Um, so supernovae we have been studying for um, centuries, and we understand them, the different classes. Um, this is now um, a collage of light curves detected by um, the spirit survey with uh, 4.5 micron luminosity, mid-infrared lumen neutron star black holes. Um, so, um, but I'm going to disappoint you yet again because I'm not going to be talking about electromagnetic counterparts to gravitational waves. Uh, Wiki is going, Wiki Calogera is here, and she's going to be telling you about that tomorrow um, afternoon. 
Um, so she will tell you about the dawn of the gravitational wave era, uh, where LIGO is going to hear gravitational waves, and the astronomers are going to go find the associated gold and platinum and the sites of heavy element nuclear synthesis. Um, this will happen. Um, I'm optimistic. And um, this uh, revolution in time domain astronomy is being taken to the next frontier uh, with many, many facilities. There's, um, I would say, at least a dozen facilities coming online um, in the next few years to search new, uh, new and um, uh, the optical phase space in much, uh, much more intensely than it has ever been done before. My favorite is this one on Palomar Mountain um, called the Zwicky Transient Facility, uh, where we are building a 47 square degree camera. Uh, the ca the, all 16 CCDs are actually in our lab already. So this one will be put on the telescope May 2017, um, so exactly one year from now. And we have a robotic spectrograph that will be doing the follow-up. And uh, this is the National Science Foundation uh, Mid-Scale Innovation Program. And we will have a survey speed of about uh, nearly 4,000 square degrees an hour. So we run out of sky in four hours. That's how fast we're imaging the sky. Um, but we don't stop there. Um, I'm also organizing a follow-up. Um, since we're going to be looking now in the sub-day regime, an hour, um, hour and daytime scales, sunrise starts to get in the way uh, and becomes quite annoying that the Earth doesn't rotate a little bit slower. Um, so, um, so we try and follow up these very ephemeral flashes of light that are rapidly declining by going around the globe, um, but by making friends with people in many different countries and org organizing and orchestrating a, a dedicated systematic follow-up campaign. Um, so just as an example, uh, the first one uh, to undergo this sort of follow-up. Um, this again, you'll hear about Wiki tomorrow, this first gravitational wave detection uh, from two 30 solar mass black holes. Um, we went and imaged with our Palomar telescopes, got eight candidates, and within two hours, uh, and two hours is the upper limit, in less than two hours, we got eight spectra and classified all eight. So, um, so that's, um, that's great. If, if um, gravitational waves are in fact associated with um, bright blue flashes of light in the optical wave bands, I think we'll find it, okay? Now the only question is, what if, they, what if um, enough free neutrons don't escape in beta decay? Or what if that hypermassive neutron star is not stable enough for just 100 milliseconds and we get no optical light at all? Um, so the theorists have been uh, scaring us and that you know, this is, may or may not happen. And in fact, most of the emission that you see from these exotic mergers may be in a completely different wave band, which is the infrared. Um, so let me ex explain that a little bit more. Um, so uh, what uh, theorists, in particular Dan Kaysen, Brian Metzger, um, and others have shown um, is that um, when a neutron star merges with another neutron star or a black hole, um, you have a heavy element synthesis. And you have our, your, our process nuclear synthesis. You're, you're synthesizing elements with atomic mass numbers between 100 and 200. So these are your lanthanides and actinides, um, that part of the periodic table. And as you will remember from freshman chemistry, I mean, these are quantum principal quantum numbers G is of 14 and um, opacities depend on G factorial times G, uh, N factorial divided by G minus N factorial so and that whole thing squared so basically these things might be very very opaque when it comes to um, uh, the optical wave bands and the peak of the emission might be in the infrared so unless you have free neutrons that can escape all of this or you have a hypermassive neutron star that's that remains stable for a few hundred milliseconds all of that emission might be in the infrared. And in the infrared, astronomy as a community is very ill-equipped. I just told you about a 47 square degree camera in the optical. The biggest, widest infrared field of view camera we have is the Vista camera. And we don't even have that. That's, it's the Europeans. Um, and that's a 0.6 square degree camera. And it's a $40 million, very expensive camera on, um, that, that we have. Next is 0.16 square degrees, which is Euclid. And everything else is 0, 0.0 something or smaller. So we have no, nowhere near the kind of wide field capability, which is essential to go and image those large localizations. We haven't actually undertaken a systematic infrared search for transients at all. We don't know what the infrared transient sky has to offer. So this really is very new territory, and it's limited by two reasons, two very, very practical, boring reasons. Um, the first is that the night sky is very bright in the infrared, um, and uh, just getting past that sky background, if you're on Earth, 
is, is a huge problem. You can't get uh, anywhere near the sensitivities you can get in the optical because the sky is much darker then. Very basic problem. The second problem is that uh, the de detector development is dominated or monopolized by one company called Taladyne, and these mercury cadmium telluride detectors are extremely expensive. Um, the per detector cost is, is, is astronomical. Um, so <laughs> please excuse me excuse me hello everyone all right so since I'm today's host and since I'm surrounded by friends who just participated in the Sackler conference down the street I have no problem saying that we've saved the best colloquium for last <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Monzi Cosleywell who is visiting us from Caltech where she's assistant professor of astronomy I know Monzi to be an energetic scientist uh, who isn't afraid to boldly go in wavelength and time regimes where people have never gone before, right? <laughs> and if they haven't, well, she's likely going to be the first to get there and characterize it the best. I say this because of the tremendous success she's had with the Palomar Transient Factory, where she's kind of, she had this mission to bridge the luminosity gap between novae and supernovae. Now, me, I look at the, the diagram, and I'm happy that there's two families, but she saw an opportunity, <laughs> and she took it. Uh, some trivia. So I learned today that after finishing as an undergraduate at Cornell, I hope you don't mind if I share this with everybody, uh, in a degree in applied engineering physics, she went to, or should I say she was actually flown to Wall Street to, to have an interview with Citibank. So given her rapid rise and success in transient astronomy, I wonder... Uh, what it would be like, because she ultimately declined that offer. I wonder if she actually took that offer, <laughs> what kind of billionaire she would be today <laughs> afterwards. I don't know if you think about that much, but we're very happy that you've uh, stayed in astronomy. The, uh, we are more enriched because of it. Uh, well, I'll leave it at that. Monzi, we all look forward to your talk today, your explosive talk, nonetheless, on the dynamic infrared sky, please. Thank you very much, Danny. That was a very generous introduction. Um, I hope I live up to that and you enjoy the next hour. Um, so thank you very much to Howard for having me here today um, as their final colloquium speaker. Uh, let's try to end with a bang. Um, so quite literally, uh, today I'm going to tell you about the dynamic infrared sky. Uh, but before I go further, I'd like to dedicate this talk to Professor James Houck. Uh, he was my undergraduate advisor at Cornell University. Um, I was at Cornell when the Space Telescope was launched, and, um, and I, I, I think I'm an astronomer today uh, thanks to that experience. Okay, um, so let's get started. Um, so my motivation behind uh, venturing into this new unexplored phase space, um, it's actually the perk of this new job I have at Caltech. Um, I walked into uh, my office on September 1st of uh, 2015, and the first thing I see is an old desk. If you look closely at the desk, you'll see stains of coffee mug stains and slightly smaller than coffee mug stains do, uh, but we'll get to that later. And I was wondering, why do I have this like giant desk in my office? There wasn't even a chair, there was just a desk. Um, so then I realized that there's a pink sticky note and the desk is the desk of Professor Fritz uh, And within a few days of arriving at Caltech, I got an email from his daughter saying, would you like the matching bookshelf and books and the typewriter? <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I, 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 I'm deeply honored to have an office with uh, you know, such literal inspiration. So Caltech takes standing on the shoulders of giants very, very seriously. Um, so Professor Zwicky um, is an inspiration. Um, this is what I call the Zwicky diagram. Um, Danny described this to you. Um, when I was at Harvard in 2010, that's um, you know, when um, I first described this, this diagram. So this is just uh, taking the optical transient phase space, uh, plotting it by two parameters, peak luminosity in physical units for those who prefer Earths per second, 
and time scales from one day to a hundred days. Two families of explosions we know very well, very very deeply about: classical novae, thermonuclear explosions on the surfaces of white dwarfs. Two flavors of supernovae, uh, white dwarf explosions here, and deaths of massive stars here. This diagram is from 2005, very outdated. This diagram now looks like this when I was at Harvard the last time. Actually, more like this. There are many, many new classes of explosions. And your very own Maria Drought, who just graduated, uh, 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 I think, a few days ago. Um, Dr. Drought has told you about a new class, which I haven't yet added to this diagram, but which lives right here, of fast blue transients from pan stars. Uh, but I'm not going to be telling you about any of this, because this game, I've had to take my diagram and squeeze it to the right and push it up, because phase space is opening up even more. The revolution in optical time domain surveys is intense. And what we are after now is something that lives in this part of the diagram. The mergers of neutron stars um, with another neutron star or 